Hey, Jim, I'm getting a bunch of packages this weekend. Uh, I was hoping you could give me some pointers and putting them into uh, dead out equipment. I, unfortunately, I'm pretty good at that, Jeff. I <laughs> know a lot about dead outs and a lot about replacement packages. And you, let me tell you, here in Ohio, you're right on schedule because there's snow and freezing rain coming down. So it's a great day to be getting packages. <laughs> oh, shoot. Well, fortunately, here in the Pacific Northwest, we are going to have a, a fairly decent day. And so I'm looking forward to it. And uh, so it's it's good timing this year. Well, I want to I want to talk about this with you as much as I know. I'm Jim, too. And I'm Jeff Ott, pinch hitting for Tim Flottam one more week. And we're coming with you, talk to you on uh, Honeybee Obscura, where we talk all things beekeeping once a week or so. And today, we want to see if we can figure out what Jeff, and to some extent what I can do with our dead equipment, to get it ready to put bees back on it. You are listening to Honeybee Obscura, brought to you by Growing Planet Media, the folks behind Beekeeping Today podcast. Each week on Honey Bee Obscura, host Kim Flottam and Jim Too explore the complexities, the beauty, the fun, and the challenges of managing honeybees in today's world in an engaging and informative discussion meant for all beekeepers, long timers, and those just starting their journey with bees. So sit back and enjoy the next several minutes as Kim and Jim explore all things honeybees. Jeff, is important. Uh, to know exactly what have you got? What kind of dead out? What kind of equipment? Uh, what's the situation? Is it terrible or just bad? <laughs> well, it's, yeah, it's never good. So the dead out, it, it, or, or my colonies from last year that didn't make it through the winter, whether they died during the fall or during the winter, I was able to go out to them in January, I think, when it was freezing cold outside and I uh, knew they were dead, and I cleaned them out at that time. So I know that they're dead completely. I've I've already removed all the dead bees from them, uh, and uh, they've been sitting there ever since. So it's eight frame equipment, full deeps on the hive bodies, uh, no honey supers, fairly clean equipment. That's what I have. That it's pretty typical, isn't it? Number one, mm-hmm. let me say this point blank to you and all the listeners. This is just you and me talking. Yep. I mean, everything we talk about is going to be a variation on a theme. <laughs> but if you went out in January and you cleaned the bees out, what does that mean? Did you just pour the dead bees off the bottom board? Or did you bang the, the bees that were stuck in the comb? Did you bang the combs and lock the bees out of that? Yeah, yeah, good question. Um, because in prior years, I've, I know that if you wait till March or April to clean the bees out, they become a big moldy mess, a green, gray, white moldy mess. Yeah. And, yep. and that's horrible and it's heartbreaking. So I wanted to get to them before that got to that stage. So I, I, took, them, I took out each frame. One by one, took it way out in the field, shook it off, cleaned it off. I had a bee brush, um, and I brushed off what I could and put it back in the box and uh, actually and and did it that way. Well, that sounds pretty typical. You know, you mentioned the mold, and the mold mm-hmm. is always frightening. And I've I've done this for a long time, and unfortunately, I've seen my my share of dead bees, and that mold is always overwhelming you know you yeah. think well this has got to be a disease pathogen it's just got to be chalk brood you got especially as a newer beekeeper you rattle these things off but the, apparently jeff that mold is other than just being innocuous and indicating that there's too much moisture and there's decay going on it's not thought to harbor some kind of pathogen so if kim were here he'd be arguing now that you shouldn't <laughs> be using that comb you should be throwing comb away and he's right and he's wrong, but how old is the comb? Is it comb worth using, worth reusing? Uh, looks like it's pretty healthy. Make a decision right then yeah. before you reinvest another season and comb that should be discarded. Well, yeah, and that was a big point of using the dead out equipment is I don't want the bees to expend all that energy drawing out new foundations. So yep. uh, I'd like the queen to get right to work so that uh, I, you know, it's even possible that they might get a honey crop. Aren't, a small you one. Just a, aren't you just an old man? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because those of us who t- were taught to keep bees before Varroa want to reuse that comb. Yeah. 
because that was a big selling point. That comb is reusable. You don't have to have the bees invest all that honey in mm-hmm. comb production because they're reusing the old comb. Mm-hmm. And it's been very bitter for me to have to accept the fact that that comb does have a, a natural life. And if you're a really great beekeeper on a, an annoyingly dependable schedule, you take out perfectly usable comb and let the bees replace it. So, right off the bat, is this comb you want to use again for or not? I would go, yes, let's use some comb again. Yeah. I mean, I, sometimes I get, you, you read all the literature and you listen to people talk and you start having nightmares about all the potential bugaboos and pathogens and pesticides and everything else that might be in that wax and it scares you ever to pieces. But I want to reuse it. It looks fairly clean. It's not real dark. That's it, not full of uh, old uh, uh, pupa cases and everything else. So, yeah, yep. I'm going to reuse it. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm with you on that. I'm with you on that. I'm going to get my thoughts together. And while you and I both do that, let's take a moment and hear from the folks who helps us pay the bill. What makes Better Be Different as a beekeeping supplier is their focus on bringing new, innovative products to the market such as the Colorado Bee Vac. The Colorado Bee Vac is the world's leading bee vacuum, trusted to quickly and safely capture bees during cutouts or swarms and easily transfer them to a hive. The Colorado Bee Vac was carefully crafted and tested to relocate bees while drastically minimizing any losses. Visit betterbee.com slash bvac to learn more and get yours today. One of the important things, Jeff, that I wonder about is, do you have any honey at all? Since you want to have the bees get right to work, you said, how, how are you going to feed those packages? Yeah, so all of the, all of the dead outs are, are two-story hive boxes, and uh, uh, brood chambers. And yeah, there's honey in every one of them. Um, the lower ones, if I put them back together in the way that I pulled them apart, uh, are have less honey than the ones on top. The ones on top are are heavy with honey. And some of it smells, uh, some of it's capped. Some of it may not be so capped. Some of it, some of the boxes smell like it's good. Uh, There's no smell. And others smell like maybe it's fermenting or something. There's a sour smell to it. So, you know, so you start thinking about that. Well, I've I've tried to come up with an idiom for saying that efficient beekeeping approach you sloppiness, but that doesn't sound right. That doesn't read right. (laughs) When are you efficient and when are you sloppy? But I had, like you, I've had honey several last seasons Mm -hmm. because when my bees die from varroa predation in the winter, it's kind of a clean kill. Yep. Just a bunch of dead bees and there's no, you know, there's there's no real mess there. Right. So what do with that honey? And I have found, and I want to be very careful now, Jeff and listeners, mm-hmm. don't don't go crazy with this, <laughs> but bees can take remarkably solid or unsightly honey and work miracles with it. They can reclaim it, recover it, reconstitute it, process it, and the, the advantage to that is in the right format, if I could use that word incorrectly. It's in the right place. It's in comb. Yeah. So if you've got honey to put back on to give them, uh, they will do a quick job of cleaning that up. Yeah. Uh, and that, that's been my experience in the past, but just, you know, always always looking for a better way of doing things to uh, make sure I put the bees in the best position possible so that they make it through the season. I'd rather have to deal with swarms than feeding a, <laughs> a new package well, at the beginning of it. So uh, it doesn't, may not sound like it to the listeners, but you and I at this point are thousands of miles apart. Are you expecting bad weather tomorrow and Sunday when you put these bees in? Fortunately, no. It uh, According to the little weather app, it's supposed to be a fairly decent day. So I'll be lucky. That, that will be to your advantage if uh, if you've got this bit of honey you can give them. And at the same time, I uh, can give them enough drawn comb that the queen, you know, as soon as you can release her mm-hmm. to put them out there. 
So you've, one of the things you're going to have to decide now is how much foundation you're going to put in. Are you going to go all drawn comb? Those are all your call. That's all your decision. But uh, after you decide what you're going to keep, the comb, and what you're going to have mm-hmm. the bees rebuild, then you've got the bees that you're going to put on tomorrow. The equipment's all assembled. Mm-hmm. Everything's good to go. So this time, you're going to get it right. Hope springs eternal, right? <laughs> That's so, right. <laughs> even though you hoped this about this very colony a year ago, didn't work, but now we have fresh hope, and we're going to try again. So what I'd like to ask you is, what will be your Varroa control program? Do you think these packages are already treated safely enough, or just you well, as an individual beekeeper? What are you going to do with these packages in Varroa? They always tell you, whether you buy a nuke or a package, yes, they've been treated. <clears throat> but I'm more of a suspicious kind of guy, and, and it's more like trust but verify, or um, I, I stumble on this, obviously, and I'm doing it right now. So I, t- I tend to end up treating them on my equipment. That way I know for sure when they've been treated and the date they've been treated and how they've been treated. So if it, if I'm using OA uh, as a oxalic acid, uh, I will treat them with oxalic acid. Sometimes in the past, I've in the packages, I've, I've treated them with oxalic acid uh, mixed into sugar and uh, I've sprayed them with one with sugar and then I do one with the oxalic acid and sugar uh, to treat them in the package while they're, all the mites are just traveling on their bodies. And I've also have treated them uh, uh, vaporizing uh, the oxalic acid once they've been hived. I am so relieved to have you stumble <laughs> because now it's my turn to, st- to stumble. This is really an uncertain topic area. Mm-hmm. It's uncertain even for colonies that overwintered. I mean, they're out there right now. My bees are out here right now, the ones that overwintered. Mm-hmm. And you think, well, I should go treat those bees. Well, you know, in all cases, do no harm. If they got through the winter, does that mean that their varroa load is okay? And do you still go out there and fix it? Or if they got through the winter and you think, well, they did something right, so let's let this get more into the season before I start treating. There's always that feeling of insecurity and uncertainness about exactly what to do. And then you get these mm-hmm. packages, and the first thing you're going to do is expose them to some kind of toxin to knock the varroa mites off. And you, th- you want to do the right thing. Yeah. It's hard to tell what the right thing is. I would probably treat them, but I would do it kind of with my heart in my throat. I don't know if I would, I wouldn't treat them until the queen was released. I don't know why. What's your guess on that? Would you treat them with the queen confined? Well, I'll probably be wrong, <laughs> but I, I would treat them with the queen confined. I have no, I, I don't see any reason why not to. And I'd like to treat him before she starts laying, and especially, you know, obviously before any brood is capped. So, you know, I, I really don't, I don't see a reason why it would make a difference, queen okay, confined shoot, shoot, or not confined. Shoot a hole in this. Maybe mm-hmm. since there's just two of us talking, I'll take the other tact. For no particular reason, I would say I would release the queen. Mm hmm. And the only reason I can think of as you and I talk would be if something is not right with my treatment, that in theory, the queen could move to a more tolerable part of the hive. But Mm -hmm. that's me. That's me grasping at anything right here, because I don't really know what to do with these packages. Do you just take them and put them in and then, you know, wait till late, till summer, and treat them then, or do you try to get off to a good start? I don't know that there's a right answer. I'm sure our listeners might, and I'd, we'd be interested in hear what you, the listener, like to do in, in the comments section on the show notes. So let us know, because Jim and I obviously are struggling with this. I am struggling. I am struggling. So let me ask one more question, and this one I really don't know after... I, I don't have a solid foundation on is do you with a package 
prefer to put a second hive body on right away if it has honey and open comb in it? Or do you put that package and leave them in a single hive body till they get established? I've done it. I've done it both ways, and I, I wish I could settle on something, but I can't. When you say both ways, there's even more ways than that. You can put them in a new. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you got all kinds of options. I tend to put them in the least amount of equipment that they can handle. So if I've got honey to give them, I want the honey right there beside the empty brood frame or two. So mm-hmm. I most of my packages, after I've installed them, are just single deeps. Okay. If there's some reason, I may have an empty shell up top. I may have a feeder inside an empty mm-hmm. shell, and outwardly mm-hmm. it might look like two deeps, but actually it's ten top. And I only do that because I have some notion, some faint idea that bees swarm cluster needs to approximate the cavity size. So you wouldn't normally put three pounds of bees in something the size of a 55-gallon drum. But I don't know what those dimensions are. I don't know what the relativity is. So hesitating again, uh, I would probably just keep them in the least amount of equipment. Number one, that's that's the least amount of work for me. (laughs) And number two, it's just less that the bees have to maintain. In fact, it's really off the subject. Mm-hmm. has nothing to do with, with using dead-out equipment. But, you know, there's these devices that you can get at various bee supply companies. And I think the, hours, the sponsor may be one of them that's called a follower board. And it's like a, a, a petition. So you can actually petition off the inside of mm-hmm. the hive body so that maybe it only has uh, three or four frames in it. If you're a big proponent of the cluster fitting the space. You can actually modify the equipment. Yeah, Boy, you know, we started this episode, I thought I'd have answers, but now I just have more questions. I, I know what I would do. I, I'm trying to, <laughs> you know, I'm struggling. Why have I struggled the whole time with this, Jeff? This is pretty straightforward. You get a package, put the package in, be sure they got honey, read for mites, don't bother them, be sure the queen's out, and you'll be fine. That's right. Well, why is it taking us 20 minutes of struggling to explain that it's not really that clear? You've got a lot of options you can do here. You paid a lot of money for these packages. Mm-hmm. It's going to be really hard to replace that queen if you don't get her introduced right. Right. So you want to you want to have a notion that what you're doing is the right thing to do, and the right thing to do is not the right thing in every instance. That's the joy of beekeeping. The joy. <laughs> Let me think what word I would have used there. <laughs> well, we wouldn't have been doing it for this long if it was digging, ditch, digging ditches. Let me tell all the listeners this, though. It's that time of the year. It is springtime. Yep. Packages and nukes are coming in. There's hope for the season. There's rebirth for the spring. This is a good time of the year for beekeeping. So do, do something. Control mites. Feed them. Be sure the queen's out. And I bet you they'll be okay. Well, I'll let you know how it goes after I got them all hived. All right. Jeff, as usual, I want to thank all the people who listen to us struggle with this. <laughs> I, uh, I pr- appreciate them. If you're still listening, you're tough. You're tough. Uh, good luck with it. I always enjoy talking to you, Jeff. All right. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate it. I've enjoyed the last couple of weeks being on, but uh, I know we're looking forward to having Kim back as well. So. Yeah. Okay. Take care. <laughs>